We've covered all kinds of ships on this channel, from the hugely successful to the tragic and the lost, but we haven't talked much about the many strange vessels that have been built through the years, from those intended for specific or unusual purposes like the floating instrument platform, or the flip as it's known, or those ugly ducklings built with challenging aesthetics like the poor old SS L'Atlantique. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs, and today we're going to explore some of the more unusual and weird and wonderful ships from history. Now, in my opinion, weird ships can be broken down into three basic categories. The aesthetically bizarre, functionally strange, and the historically weird. Let me explain. First of all, we have those aesthetically bizarre ships. Ships whose external or internal appearance is just extremely unusual. Now, there are so many examples of these that spring to mind. A favourite of the maritime history community are the French pre-dreadnought battleships. Now, these monsters were truly bizarre in form and function alike. Now, this was back in the days when ships had only relatively recently transitioned over to steam power and steel hulls. Gun technology was just catching up, so you ended up with these hulking, enormous vessels which somehow look like a cross between a 19th century gunship and a hotel block. To give them stability, they featured very prominent tumble home. Now, a tumble home is where the hull of a ship curves way out, so it's wider at the waterline than at the top deck, which is kind of the opposite of how things normally are. It prevents rolling, but it also just looks super strange when it's this extreme. Now, the French loved a good tumble home in the late 1800s, as the ironclad Charlemagne here very aptly demonstrates. But as far as French pre-dreadnoughts go, Charlemagne is actually kind of good looking and pretty run of the mill compared to something like this, the pre-dreadnought Carnot. Now, quite honestly, this looks almost exactly like a floating building. And in fact, many derisively referred to them at the time as floating hotels. They were actually built to counter British sea power at the time. And yes, all those openings are windows. Then there was the Messina, with her unfortunate protruding bow, which kind of resembles an enormous chin. Unsurprisingly, many of these vessels were monstrously overweight and suffered from all kinds of horrible stability issues as a result. It prevented them from being useful in any kind of meaningful context, and few survived beyond the First World War. It's just such an interesting era of ship design when for a brief moment in time, the world's most fearsome warships look more like office blocks. Speaking of French vessels, the weirdness wasn't just reserved for their warship fleet. This is the small, yet mighty, SS L'Atlantique. A true trailblazer when she was introduced in the 1920s, this was just a critical decade for the designers of ocean liners, as the Edwardian Age gave way to the Jazz Age. L'Atlantique's interiors weren't inspired by those older styles of ships from the, the Golden Age of the Belle Epoque. Instead, she was heavily influenced by Art Deco, and the French line spared no expense in making her one of the most beautiful ocean liners afloat. On the inside, at least. On the outside, things are a little bit different. Ocean liners were usually long, elegant things. They relied on a longer hull form, which is the ship's sheer length, to move faster through the water. Now, French line changed things up a bit with L'Atlantique. She presented a short, squat, almost stubby profile, and there are very few angles where this thing looks in proportion. If you're looking at it wondering what else is wrong, but can't quite put a finger on it, let me help you out. L'Atlantique was built without any real shear. Now, ships used shear back then as a way to provide buoyancy towards the bow and the stern of the ship, where the lines were the sharpest, having thin, Fine lines at the bow of the ship could help it cut faster through the water, but with less ship to help it float, it was likely that the vessel would pitch up and down violently, so instead, shear could mitigate that by curving both ends of the ship upward, providing simply more ship to float at those ends, reducing that violent pitching. Now, French Line built L'Atlantique almost without any shear, using that squat hull form itself to mitigate the pitching effect. It was a revolutionary attempt at innovation, but it wouldn't catch on for some time yet. French Line's subsequent liners, like Normandy, used shear in the traditional way. But L'Atlantique, as weird as she looked, might have simply been just too far ahead of her time, because nowadays cruise ships are effectively built without any shear at all. Now, aesthetics are one thing, and goodness knows there have been plenty of uh, interesting looking ships like the Johan van Olden Barnevelt here. But another key area where weird ships shine is in their function and their purpose. Now, some ships are just designed to do weird jobs, even though from the outside, they don't show it. 
One ship that absolutely did show it though was known appropriately as FLIP, F-L-I-P, an acronym for Floating Instrument Platform. Now this was a self-sufficient research platform designed to operate in the open ocean. Now in that sense, yes, it wasn't really a ship, but rather a platform that would be towed out to its destination in the horizontal plane, like a normal vessel, before it reached the designated research point, but then something truly bizarre would happen. Tanks in the stern would be flooded, the bulkheads would contain the water, and the resulting shift in the centre of buoyancy would make the flip do a flip. She would sit back with her stern dropping into the water until the whole bow was pointed clear up into the air at about 90 degrees. Now, FLIP was built in the early 1960s to study waves, water temperature and weather patterns. She had no engines because these could mess with her delicate research equipment. In fact, I don't even know why I'm calling FLIP her like a traditional ship, I guess it's just an old habit. In any case, because of FLIP's strange operation, many design innovations had to be made. For example, fittings like toilets and showers could either rotate through 90 degrees, or they simply curved around to work in both orientations. Both ceilings and walls had lights so they could illuminate the interior in any direction of operation. Now, it was truly a strange vessel, finally decommissioned after the COVID pandemic and scrapped in 2023. Of Flip's unusual design, the director of the Marine Physical Laboratory said it was built in an era of risk-taking, a spirit that we try to embrace to this day and encourage the next generation of seagoing scientists. Okay, okay, so maybe uh, Flip wasn't a ship in the, uh, in the strictest sense. Let me make it up to you. How about this ridiculous thing? More like a gun with a ship just kind of strapped onto it for fun. This is the HMS Marshall Ney, built and launched during the First World War. She was known as a monitor, essentially a class of ship dating way back to the age of sail. The simple idea of a monitor was to slap a disproportionately large gun onto a simple floating platform. Now, some of these monitors through the 19th and early 20th century looked conventional enough, but it was surely the British monitors of the First and Second World War that take the cake for bizarre function and aesthetic all in one. Marshall Ney was only about 6,600 tons and 355 feet long, about the size of a light cruiser, albeit a lot heavier. Now, of course, a lot of the displacement and that weight was taken up by the ridiculous, enormous gun turret carried right in the middle of the ship. Now, this thing had twin 15-inch, 380mm battleship caliber guns in a single turret. Now, almost the very definition of a glass cannon, the Royal Navy monitors had almost no armor and a hopeless top speed of about 6 knots. Now, compare that to the speed of a cruiser, about 20 to 25 knots or so. Now, the reason for this was the poor reliability of her diesel engines, which one admiral from the time recalled frequently exploded when asked to start. Her engine room was scarred as if by shrapnel from the fragments of burst cylinder heads, and the escapes of the engine room staff were miraculous. Perhaps not surprisingly, Royal Navy monitors functioned best in a short bombardment role where they could hit targets far inland in support of amphibious invasions. Now, some classes served well into the Second World War, like HMS Erebus and her sister Terra. Truly strange little ships with a very niche purpose. Another unusual type of ship was the Q-ship and Commerce Raider of the First and the Second World Wars. Now, these things look pretty standard from the outside, boring even, but they harboured a deadly secret. At the time, in the First World War, submarines and warships of all nations hunted freely, targeting enemy merchant ships to put strain on economies and supply lines. Now, merchant ships were slow, lumbering, and virtually defenceless. But then some bright sparks in the Admiralty got an idea. What if you could disguise a deadly warship as just a hapless merchant vessel? With that, the Q-ship was born. Now, this wasn't an entirely new concept. In fact, this exact kind of naval ruse has been used for centuries. Back in the days of sail, warships would fly the flags of allied or neutral nations in order to confuse their enemies, dropping the disguise at the last possible moment before attacking. Q-ships took this idea to the next level. From the outside, they resembled simple merchant freighters, but their deck houses harbored deadly four or six inch guns that could come crashing out from behind portable bulkheads at a moment's notice. They carried advanced and powerful radio sets to communicate with friendly vessels hundreds of miles away, and they coordinated their intercepts. They had mines, and some even carried float planes. Now, the Q-ships and the auxiliary cruisers of this kind had a very simple purpose in mind. Catch enemy ships unaware and do as much damage as possible. Now, British Q-ships did some fine work during the First World War, but it was probably the German raiders that perfected the craft. Possibly the strangest of these was Seadler, a converted sailing bark which looked from the outside like a harmless, antiquated sailing ship, 
But of course, this simple disguise was used to great effect to lull enemy ships into a false sense of security because Sayadla sunk and captured dozens of ships during the First World War, commanded by the charismatic, eccentric lunatic skipper Felix von Luckner. Now his escapades are legendary and they are definitely deserving of their own video, but suffice it to say this plucky little commerce raider amassed an impressive tally despite the fact that the ship had originally been built to carry such exciting cargoes as grain and timber. So a little bit like the commerce raiders and the cue ships that might have been converted into the raiding role, there are plenty of ships that were designed with one specific purpose in mind that then ended up doing completely different and bizarre jobs. Another great weird maritime site from history is that of the great passenger ship Great Eastern laying the transatlantic cable in 1865. Now, just how exactly the world's largest passenger ship came to be relegated to a role as relatively utilitarian as laying a cable is a fascinating tale also deserving of its own video. Essentially, Great Eastern had been introduced to a world not yet ready for a ship of her size. Her genius inventor, Isambard Brunel, thought her design would revolutionise ocean going travel. The idea was to carry hundreds of migrants out to Australia in a single trip without needing to bunker for coal or be delayed by huge waves or becoming becalmed in situations where there was no wind. Now, relying on her paddles and her single propeller, the idea was that the Great Eastern would be able to forge ahead and make the massive journey in record times. But sadly for Great Eastern and her inventor, she was just too far ahead of the time. On introduction, this awkward beast was mocked for her ungainly appearance and what was then seen as excessive size. On top of that, the ship had a very unfortunate start, featuring collisions, groundings, horrible, horrible sea state, and even a boiler explosion at one point. After a very short stint doing her intended role as a passenger ship, the massive vessel was bought by a company who loaned her out for a specific and relatively unusual purpose, laying the transatlantic cable telegraph. And so it was that the world's largest passenger ship essentially just became a cable laying vessel, but proved remarkably good at the job. She had to carry no less than 22,450 kilometers. That's around 14,000 miles of cable, which she could do well thanks to her massive size and all those huge public rooms. By contrast, the first cable layers, the converted warships Agamemnon and Niagara, could carry only 5,000 nautical miles of cable between them. In the end, this unusual ship went on to have an even more bizarre role, becoming a floating billboard steaming up and down the Mersey, advertising Lewis's department store in Liverpool. She was so big and so filthy by that point that it was estimated she was carrying some 300 tons of unwanted weeds and grime below the waterline. Disposing of a monster like that was then a feat as yet unattempted. One plan involved filling her with gunpowder and blowing her up. But in the end, the Great Eastern was scrapped in the usual way, dismantled bit by bit. Now another great example of a ship being repurposed for a bizarre job is the destroyer HMS Campbelltown. Now, despite her name, Campbelltown wasn't really British. She was originally built in the good old USA, a World War One era Wix class destroyer named USS Buchanan. Now this may surprise you, but usually ships are designed not to explode. And originally USS Buchanan was no different, but then a strange turn of events saw her being reworked with that specific goal in mind. And she did it very well indeed. In 1940, a deal was struck between Britain, then at war with Nazi Germany, and neutral USA. Britain would give the USA land in British possessions to establish bases like in Newfoundland, the Bahamas, Jamaica, Trinidad and more. Now, in exchange, some 50 obsolescent US destroyers would be given to the Royal Navy, which was desperately short of much needed convoy escorts and submarine hunters. Now those 50 destroyers, at the time, were in a very tragic state. Most required massive overhaul since they'd been mothballed in dilapidation. One admiral reflected that they were the worst destroyers he'd ever seen, and an advisor to Churchill informed the US government that, quote, we have so far only been able to bring a few of your 50 destroyers into action on account of the many defects. So it was that Buchanan arrived to be taken over by the Royal Navy. As a destroyer, she was really nothing to write home about. But then some bright planners got an idea. In 1942, a commando raid was planned to attack the dry dock at saint nazaire in France to render them useless to the German Navy. It would force them to take their massive battleships like Taupitz and Scharnhorst elsewhere for repair. The Campbelltown and 18 other ships steamed over and the Campbelltown made her move, running at near full speed. The ship rammed straight into the gate of the dry dock in full view of the astonished Germans. The commandos disembarked the ship under a murderous hail of gunfire. They quickly got to work demolishing equipment and pump machinery, but took heavy casualties. 
In the end, the majority were captured and rounded up once their ammunition was expended and the mission was finished. The next day, as the Germans examined the damage to the dry dock, they must have thought it was a pretty paltry effort. The Campbelltown would need to be towed out and scuttled, sure, but otherwise the dock would probably be operational again in a few weeks' time. Forty German officers and workers were touring the ship, curiously looking around the captured enemy vessel, and then it happened. Campbelltown erupted in a monstrous, percussive explosion that vaporized her bow and most of the dock gate around her. She had actually been secretly packed with four and a half tons of high explosive set in concrete, invisible to the curious Germans deep within her bow. Everybody aboard was vaporized in an instant. Dozens and dozens of workers and civilians nearby who were curiously looking on were wiped out as well. In fact, some 360 people were killed as Campbelltown disintegrated and the true purpose of the raid was revealed and achieved. The end result was that the docks were knocked out not just until the end of the war, but until 1948. Now this too is one of the oldest tricks in the book. For centuries, fire ships were used as sacrificial weapons to sail into enemy fleets and cause horrendous damage. But no sacrificial ship probably ever did so tremendous a job as Campbelltown did that day, and in such dramatic, horrifying fashion. So there you go, by no means a uh, comprehensive list of the weirdest ships of all time. If you know of any other ships you'd like for us to cover that you think are a little bit unusual, please go ahead, leave a comment down in the comment section, and we'll check them out the next time we look at history's weirdest ships. Ladies and gentlemen, it's your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. Thank you so much for watching this video. If you enjoyed it, please leave a comment below. And don't forget to subscribe to the channel because we get new videos out weekly. If you want to support my work and get really cool perks like behind the scenes and early access, please visit my Patreon in the link in the description below or sign up as a YouTube member. Come and join the crew. And as always, stay safe, stay happy, and I'll see you again next time.